Welcome to a special series of a Shot in the Arm podcast, sharing the mic with frontline aides. As you might be able to guess, I'm not your usual host, Ben Plumley. My name is Christine Steffling, and I'm the Executive Director of Frontline Aids. And for four episodes, we're sharing the mic to profile the crucial role of communities around the world in creating a future free from AIDS. Frontline Aids is a partnership made up of community organizations in more than 100 countries. And together we take local, national, and global action on HIV, on health, and on human rights. We've made a lot of progress over the last 30 years, but we risk losing hard-won gains. We must not lose sight that with the right investments, innovation, and community-led programs, we can end AIDS and improve the health of everyone, no matter where they live or who they are. Find out more about us at www.frontlineaids.org. And now back to Ben. And let me add my welcome. I'm Ben Plumley. And this is the fourth of our podcasts where we're sharing the mic with frontline aides. And in this episode, we are talking money, a lot of money, billions in fact, that are needed for the long-term response to AIDS, TB and malaria. In just a few days, global leaders will be meeting in New York, hosted by US President Joe Biden, to pledge what we hope will be 18 billion US dollars for the next three years of country, grassroots programs funded by the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, Malaria, and increasingly COVID. So we're going to look at the progress made to date in securing these pledges, how far further we have to go, and how realistic it is in this complex global environment to expect the Global Fund to reach those full 18 billion dollars. And we are going to explore the strange, innovative beast that is the Global Fund. Part global funding mechanism, part implementation partner and policy setter, and part an expression of the solidarity and mutual support that all of us, or at least nearly all of us around the world, can come together and agree to something positive to improve the health and human rights of everyone. And in fact, as we shall see, Frontline AIDS has played a critical role in this strange beast that is the Global Fund. And to help us make sense of this, we're joined by an incredible panel. First up, Kana Dharmaraja from Frontline AIDS. Kana, you are the uh, lead on HIV and financing, and you're also on the uh, Global Fund's Audit and Finance Committee, right? I am, yes, um, Ben. Um, And also part of the Global Fund and a developed country NGO delegation. So it's great to have you on the podcast, and you will be the font of all knowledge um, relating to to uh, what is going on at the moment. Now we're also joined from Eswatini by Eddie Mukachwa, who is the project manager at Kango. Kango is a partner of uh, Frontline Aids, but as I understand it, Eddie, you're also heavily involved in the implementation of the Global Fund grant. Um, in Eswatini. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, um, Kango is part of the uh, Frontline AIDS um, uh, as a linking organization. And uh, we are very happy to be part of this. Eswatini now is in spring, uh, which brings the, the warmer relief from the winter, inspiring more in terms of the adventure outdoor. Um, as an organization, Kango was established in 1983, where there was an acceleration and adoption of an implementation uh, of primary, primary health care, uh, which then uh, in 1986, uh, we assumed the coordinating entity for civil society. Uh, Kango is uh, currently implementing a Ready uh, Plus movement, uh, which is funded uh, by Frontline uh, through the embassy of the Netherlands in Mozambique. Uh, And I'm currently the program manager uh, leading that uh, program. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie, and welcome to the show. It's really great to have you here. Um, And last and by absolutely no means least, a friend of a Shot in the Arm podcast, fresh from uh, AIDS 22 in Montreal, is uh, Yvette Raphael. Um, Yvette, welcome back to A Shot in the Arm podcast. Where are you ringing in from today? Uh, good afternoon, Ben. And I'm today just uh, 
concluding in KZN and Durban the TB conference. So I'm excited to be part of uh, of the work that we're doing and part of the show today. I'm the executive director of Advocates for the Prevention of HIV and AIDS, and I'm also an activist, a human rights activist, and I've been watching the Global Fund very closely because of the work that we do with adolescent girls and young women. Yeah, well, let's get right into it. Um, and, and Kana, perhaps I could start with you. For our listeners and viewers who perhaps aren't familiar or aren't as familiar with all the advocacy and all the work that we've been doing around raising the profile of the Global Fund, particularly this year, could you give us a Cook's Tour, a brief summary of what the Global Fund is, what it was designed to do, and, and, and sort of your sense of what it's achieved? Thank you, Ben, for that question. Um, the Global Fund um, was created out of global solidarity and leadership. And the world came together to fight back then the deadliest pandemics confronting humanity, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And over 20 years that followed, the Global Fund Partnership has invested more than 55.4 billion, saving 50 million lives, reducing the death rates for the three diseases. Um, we are now coming into the Global Fund's seventh replenishment, um, where the Global Fund needs at least 18 billion for us to get back on track. On, um, and to build resilient, sustainable systems for health, also to strengthen pandemic preparedness to make the world more equitable, safer for future threats. So a question for you, Kana, just, just on that is, so, so what is Frontline AIDS's interest in the Global Fund? Why is it so important to you? Well, Frontline AIDS has been part of the advocacy uh, in terms of the evolution and role of civil society and communities and ensuring that investment and funds reach where it needs to go. Um, uh, today, we are one of the largest Global Fund civil society partnerships that is engaged with the Global Fund. Um, and our engagement ranges from, and the partnership engagement ranges from management implementation of grants, advocacy at all levels, technical support and community-led monitoring. And we are representation on the country coordinating mechanisms, the board, and technical working group. So if we were to sort of step back at the 38,000 foot level, we would say, uh, if I've got this right, that many of the frontline AIDS partners, like Kango, are, are actually the uh, organizations that are responsible for overseeing the implementation of global fund investments in countries. And of course, it's really important to recognize that those investments, the strategies that drive those investments, were developed by the countries themselves. Have I got that right? You have. Uh, the Frontline AIDS Partnership, we always approach the work with Global Fund on focusing on community leadership and local solutions. And organizations like Kango today are leading the national response and reaching populations that have been invisible, excluded, or discriminated against. Um, and they're using investment from Global Fund to scale up this response. And I, I think what's important is that working with independent national civil society organizations, what the Global Fund and Frontline AIDS has worked to do is build uh, through our partnership and accreditation process strong governance, programmatic, organizational, and management systems, because we do not see oh, that civil society and community organizations should just be funded for service delivery. Mm. Um, so I think with the global fund investment and the work that Frontline is did, we've seen today, we are, have some of the largest independent national civil society principal recipients or implementers, and like Hango. Um, so, and I'm sure Eddie will speak. Yeah, so more. so let's ask Eddie about that. Eddie, I mean, so so you are where the rubber hits hits the road in Eswatini. Um, what is the role that Kango plays exactly in uh, overseeing the implementation of the 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 Global Fund investment? Um, really interested to learn how all of that came about. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Kango is a civil society umbrella body. Uh, in 2015, uh, Kango assumed the role of being the principal recipient for civil society in Eswatini, uh, which uh, helped us to upscale the response uh, for HIV, TB, and malaria. Uh, therefore, 
as an organization, we set up an umbrella um, uh, grants management unit, which uh, received and, and uh, disperses uh, funds to implementing partners. So the role of being the principal recipient uh, through the global fund support has also helped the uh, civil society at national level to play their role in terms of responding to these uh, uh, three uh, health response, which is HIV, TB, and, uh, and, and, and malaria. I mean, you describe this in such a confident, matter-of-fact way, but, but it sort of blows me, uh, blows me away. Here we are, a, a coalition, essentially, of civil society organizations being responsible for the implementation. That's just, wow, that's just brilliant. We, we, through the implementation, Ben, uh, um, the current implementation that uh, is being supported by Global Fund has prioritized um, um, activities which are agreed upon at national level. As a coordinating entity, we make sure that uh, a, a consultative um, engagements are happening at national level where um, uh, organizations uh, implementing the health response come together and uh, uh, develop those country priorities. And also the engagement also involves the, um, the communities who are just uh, on the ground, especially those that are affected by the three diseases. Then from there, once those priorities uh, are, are, are in place, we make sure that we link them with the uh, national strategic framework. Then uh, those um, uh, priorities are then uh, submitted to the country uh, coordinating mechanism, which is CCM, uh, who then endorses those uh, priorities for, for, for support. Wow. I mean, Yvette, I mean, we've been... All of our work over the last 20 odd years, the Global Fund has been a backdrop. In a sense, you can't really have a conversation about um, the response to HIV and TB, particularly in South Africa, without mentioning the Global Fund. Um, how important has it been in your work over these years? Oh, uh, yes, Ben. Uh, thank you so much. And. Uh, definitely, the Global Fund has been very, uh, very uh, important in the work that we do in South Africa, and also the, the some of the big uh, changes that you've seen over the years in South Africa with regards to treatment, with regards to uh, the work we're doing with adolescent girls and young women. Uh, Global Fund goes to the spaces and some of the, um, you know, the areas in South Africa where other funders cannot reach. So basically, Global Fund is important for us. And you can also see that our president, Cyril Ramaphosa, has always been, uh, and the country, the president at any point of replenishment has always been part of and giving to the Global Fund and ensuring that we do as a country not only receive funds, but we also take part in replenishing the Global Fund. The work that is happening in South Africa by what the Global Fund is huge because some of the communities, not all funders can read. Some of our communities are very hard to find and Global Fund plays a very, very huge role, not only in the uh, HIV and AIDS field, but also in the human rights field. We know that HIV and AIDS and human rights are so greatly connected. And myself as an advocate, I've never, and as an organization, we've never received Global Fund money. But since I started my work with, uh, you know, in HIV and the work that I do, I have had an interest to look at what the Global Fund is doing. And we are almost like, I don't want to say a watchdog, but as civil society independent activists, it's important that we look at what happens to the money. And so far, the Global Fund has proven in our country to close a very, very important gap. Where our country... Do you know, it Coffers cannot cover where other funds cannot cover. Yes. Yeah. No. It it kind of it raises, I think, an an interesting point of clarification because the global fund invests in implementation, but the role of civil society 
is sort of broader than that. You mentioned the implementation role. Eddie has spoken about the the oversight role and the overall management and coordination. And Yvette has talked has spoken about this sort of uh, truth to power, uh, speaking truth to power and making sure that uh, countries are held responsible uh, for doing the work that the Global Fund has invested them in. So I, I guess my question for you then is, do, do you see do you see civil society's role in the Global Fund as um, something that is um, understood and accepted by uh, other board members, other delegations? Um, is there broad enthusiasm for this approach? Or, or is it always a sort of a slight uh, constant battle to make sure that uh, the voices and the leadership and community are truly central to the actual investments that the Global Fund makes? Yeah, but, um, well, I think at the Global Fund board level, civil society, we have three delegations of, of civil society and communities who have equal votes with other board members. So I think their civil society role and the voice has evolved. And today, in what you see with today's strategy, the new strategy of the Global Fund, it has culminated where we have a much stronger focus around where money needs to go. Um, so I think at the Global Fund board level, yes, I mean, civil society and communities voices are there. I think at the country coordinating level in countries, um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. But I think uh, when I first started engaging with the Global Fund, I was part of the country coordinating mechanism in Sri Lanka. And as a young gay man in Sri Lanka, you know, our community was invisible and we did not have a voice. But it was the first time I felt I was heard, but things evolved. And I, I think um, the CCMs have a lot more work to be inclusive and have meaningful engagement. But the processes and policies are in place. It's how they're implemented that is key. And and let me ask you, Kana, to, to sort of help clarify just how all of this works. Um, if we're going to, if the global fund, you know, is going to make an investment in a country, um, there is this sort of coordinating country coordinating mechanism that you called the CCM that pulls all the various stakeholders together. So the clinical facilities, the public health authorities, civil society, affected communities, even the private sector. And as I understand it, they put together a proposal that then goes to the Global Fund for review and approval. And then it comes back to the country and the principal recipient, the role that Eddie and Kango is playing in Eswatini, they're responsible for making sure that it's implemented properly. Now, have I got that? I mean, it's a bit simplistic, but have I basically got the model right? <laughs> I can see Eddie smiling yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of processes in between, but I think at the core of it, the Global Fund is a partnership, either at the board level or at the country level. And it's about working with multi-stakeholders. But from the beginning, the Global Fund has always pushed for country-led uh, engagement. Um, so I think, as you said, most of the time, it's the countries where a lot of the decisions are being made. So, Eddie, I got to ask you, uh, what has that experience been like? I mean, you were smiling as I as I described that very simplistic model, but it does sound, on the face of it, really quite complicated. How do you make sure that it is, you know, truly efficient and gets the results? Yes, a bit complicated, but uh, through the processes, because the vigorous engagement which uh, the Global Fund uh, um, requires uh, through the country coordinating mechanisms, make sure that everyone is involved from the government side who lead the, the, the health response, that is HIV, TB and malaria, and uh, which are the three diseases. And they make sure that all stakeholders, uh, uh, all key stakeholders are involved especially the civil society through the NGOs and the communities that are, are mostly affected, uh, just also to guide what are those priorities that need to be supported. So this process is a lengthy, um, as Kana has uh, uh, mentioned, 
but it's a very important process because it makes sure that it leaves all the uh, unturned stones so that we make sure that those priorities are, are agreed upon and is, is those priorities that will be upscaled and make an impact in terms of ending uh, HIV by 2030. Thank you. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because there are two components to this. There's the science, there's the evidence. But then, as I, 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 I think Yvette and, and Kana, you had emphasized, there is the human rights component. And, and you know, Yvette, you've, you've worked with colleagues who are Global Fund um, recipients. Um, what, what, what happens when the priorities of communities don't necessarily coincide with the priorities of governments? How, how have you seen that play out? Um, thank you. And I think in South Africa, the system is very differently uh, different because as Khan has mentioned, civil society has gotten the global fund to where it is and how it operates because of civil society. Every time questioning, every time insisting on participation and regardless of whether you are a recipient of the global fund or not. So in South Africa, it's very different because we have a very, very active and robust civil society. So from the South African National AIDS Council level, do we have our community advocates who are independent and not recipients of the Global Fund, who sit on the Global Fund board, who participate in the CCM, who participate in coming up with the plan that we are submitting to the Global Fund as a country. And that is what has led to South Africa's very, I, I want to say uh, our, our plan is very brave and very bold, and it is able to hold accountable those who receive the global fund money, but also the global fund. So we have a very engaging process. We hardly, um, because the global fund is so closely connected with the South African National AIDS Council, what we have is then the um, civil society then participate in the in 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 the proposal and the global fund what is goes into the global fund but our main document is the strategic plan for south africa Kana, which are is you something that you cannot <laughs> no we have we're really having fun with the internet gods and goddesses today aren't we blimey blimey um but but canna i wanted to come back to you so so Clearly, what Eddie is describing in Eswatini and what Yvette is describing in South Africa is a, a very a very positive interaction. And you know, here is yet another example of where the countries of Southern Africa provide the model and the leadership for the rest of the world. Are there examples in uh, frontline AIDS work where um, perhaps the governments have not taken such an evidence and rights based approach to engaging communities? Well, I, I think, um, as Eddie and Yevela said, I mean, in most countries, um, it's a continuous process of evolution. It depends where the countries are at that point of the application. Um, so there are countries that go through different points of engagement. Um, so I think in some countries, we have seen where it's been difficult, but I think through the Globe Fund processes, because of the CCM and because civil society have been active, there's a lot more pressure for government to include civil society in communities. Um, and so the CCM sometimes forms that place. So even if there is, um, you know, key populations are criminalized in the country or there's limited engagement outside, a large part during the grant process, they need to ensure meaningful engagement and inclusion. Um, so I think, yes, I mean, there's lots of countries that don't want civil society to be part of their grants because they feel it's a health response and it should be the government, it should be health systems, and there's no role for civil society and communities to play. Um, and they have, you know, uh, policies in place that discriminate, you know, um, and criminalize. So I think where the Global Fund is a good model is that if you want to get the funding, you need to bring all parties to the table. Yeah, there is a, a, a power in, in having those billions. And talking of billions, that gets us into one of the really key issues of the moment. 
We are in something called the seventh replenishment of the Global Fund. And essentially, every three years or so, the Global Fund goes to its donors, primarily uh, governments, but not exclusively, also institutions like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations, um, innovative financial uh, fundraising mechanisms like Product Red, and looks to raise money to pay for these life-saving um, uh, programs. And so here we are in uh, 2022, uh, September, and we are trying to raise, what, 18 billion. So Kana, as you look at it, how far are we? Do you think we're going to raise that 18 billion? Well, at least 18 billion. <laughs> so, I mean, 18 billion is the amount, but hopefully, you know, I mean, to get back on track and that COVID-19 has also impacted a lot of responses in countries. So, I mean, 18 billion is the number they came to and we hopefully uh, donors and um, will meet that target. Um, I think, I mean, I have faith in the partnership um, that they do believe in the work of the Global Fund and hopefully we will find out more information in the coming days. Um, as we lead up to the replenishment. But I think the message and those who have already pledged, like Germany, have shown a clear guidance of where they are and that, you know, they do believe in the Global Fund and the work the Global Fund does. So that 18 billion for the next three years is essentially a 30% increase on the previous replenishment that was hugely successful led by President Macron in Paris. Um, and, and, I, and I guess you, so you mentioned Germany and they did an extraordinary thing in the midst of everything else going on in the country, cost of living crisis, a war not too far from their borders. They made that 30% increase pledge. Kana, are there other countries that have done that? I mean, what about Japan? They also made a, a commitment a while ago. Um, Japan has as well, um, and I, I think, and then the US has done a fantastic job of committing, but we don't want to leave the US funding behind if the other countries and donors do not pledge or match their share. Um, so yeah, so I think, um, as I said before, I mean, we'll see it, you know, in the coming days. Uh, we've had small amounts here and there, but I think the majority have um, who have already pledged have stepped up to the plate and increased by 30%. And the US really kicked that off. But of course, the restrictions for the US are that they can only raise, I think it's 30% of the total amount. So if, if we're not successful in raising the balance, then money will be left on the table from the US. So the, the, uh, the pressure is on. Um, Eddie, can I turn to you? What, what's your sense of the politics of replenishment sitting as you do in Eswatini at the moment? How are people viewing it? We know, I think maybe first of all, I can say with the COVID and also the what is happening around the world with the invasion in Ukraine, we are also very skeptical in terms of the the commitment and also funding whether they will shift or not but we hope because there is a uh, already investment that have been uh, invested on the ground uh, to making sure that uh, uh, the the um, the investment that has already been uh, committed on the ground uh, we make sure that there is no disruption because once there is disruption i think it will regress uh, from the gains that we have uh, uh, achieved to date around issues of HIV. So it's just uh, cross fingers, if I may be honest, uh, to making sure that um, uh, those commitments uh, made by uh, the countries, as uh, Kana has mentioned, they, they continue to, 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 um, to be positive. And uh, as a country as well, maybe I can I can share that uh, our government is committing, although it can, it has it it can go that far, uh, not that <laughs> that far to make that impact uh, as as a, a state. 
but with uh, the resources that will be more be pro- committed in country and those from the the support from outside i think it can make that a uh, kind of impact at the moment i think we are just crossing fingers that we those commitments uh, go 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 through because we have essentially 2 billion i think it is on the table from the us so we need to uh, make sure that everyone's commitments are um, you know, thirty percent of an increase on what they previously did, so that we can get that two billion. And I think, kind of the, um, uh, the 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 question that that really strikes me, particularly from the way Eddie was describing it, um, is that the it's understood that countries in the global south may not be able to make the same kind of investments, obviously that we would see, but that statement of solidarity through some kind of a commitment is very important to the overall mission of the Global Fund, isn't it? Um, Yes, it is. And I I think part of the Global Fund work is also to support countries to put the systems in place to finance um, their um, health services. And a large part of the Global Fund investment is building the foundation for this. Um, So while the Global Fund does um, provide guidance, technical support, and um, also work closely with uh, leaders to ensure that they are putting these things in place, Um, the Global Fund also needs to ensure that money is coming to support the countries while they are trying to put more domestic funding. But I think COVID-19 has affected a lot of this. Yeah. Um, but I mean, if you look at the latest Global Fund results report, I mean, the Global Fund right now has saved more than 50 million lives right? uh, with 12.5 million people, you know, have been reached with HIV prevention services. And this is a mix of Global Fund funding, but also what countries have done, civil society, communities. So there's that whole partnership, the results are part of it. So yeah, so it takes everyone. It does. And I think, you know, again, one of the really big achievements of the last two years is that the Global Fund stepped up in uh, providing uh, services and commodities uh, for countries' COVID responses. We've seen that all over the world. And um, Yvette, I I wonder if I could turn to you here. and, And how did you see South Africa pivot to respond to COVID. And of course, South Africa, um, with its incredible laboratory um, yeah. surveillance system, was the country that identified the Omicron variant, uh, and which unfortunately got itself into trouble then with, with other countries that didn't want South Africans going anywhere near them. Dreadful, dreadful. But, but how did you see COVID affecting uh, the response? One of the biggest things that we saw, Ben, was the inability of our people to get to the clinics and to get to the services. And most of that, and also with that, the Global Fund had then some kind of funds that was sent to to organizations working with young women and girls, which made the burden a little easier. And as I mentioned, the big thing, about the Global Fund for me is pitching in where other big funders cannot come in. And it's important for us to continuously make sure that the Global Fund is funded. During COVID, we had a lot of problems. We had suddenly our young women and girls in South Africa were in lockdown with their rapists, were in lockdown with their abusers, were not able to access SRHR services. A simple thing like a condom in South Africa for the first three weeks of COVID was not available. Advocates had to come up and say, you cannot lock down condoms and say you cannot sell this. I don't know what the connection was, but that was one of the things that was not available. And we saw saw the Global Fund in South Africa step up and giving community access to funds and was able to, you know, to play that role of transition between the hard uh, ships that we were dealing with during COVID. So the, the Global Fund really, really was important during that time. Kana, there's one other um, external factor affecting replenishment. And again, I know it's something that Frontline AIDS has been deeply involved in uh, with its partner in Ukraine, the Alliance for Public Health. Um, and we have profiled their extraordinary work 
um, over the last few months. Um, uh, how are you seeing the impact of Ukraine on the attitudes of donors to step forward uh, and continue the and increase the investment in the global fund? Is it is it slowing things down at all? No, I, um, I mean from what we're seeing, I mean the global fund is continuous uh, will continues to support Ukraine, um, and same as lots of other donors, and I think. One of the ways that we can really support Ukraine right now is not, you know, fundings from different sources. And I think Global Fund is a great uh, institution that can fund the scale because Ukraine still has one of the second largest HIV epidemics in Europe. And the uh, country partners like Alliance for Public Health, uh, that we were on your podcast, but also uh, their partners and communities and societies need funding because not only are they need to make sure that they're mitigating the impact of COVID-19, but also um, from this, you know, relocation and uh, displacement, but also to make sure that they're providing lifelines to thousands of people. And, may, and lots of them are marginalized in society. And, who, and I think the Global Fund has stepped up. And by funding the Global Fund, we can support a wide range of partners in the country. And, and there's been another trend, I think, um, particularly in richer northern industrialized world countries, you might might call it the sort of a, a populist uh, twist on this, is that, you know, after 20 years of uh, billions of investment and billions of, well, billions, um, millions of lives saved, sorry, um, uh, through the Global Fund, um, well, isn't it time for countries to take care of this themselves now? They've they've benefited from the largesse of international development for this period of time. Should they should they not be doing this on their own? I can see Yvette, you putting your hand over your head at me just raising that. And I just wonder, you know, maybe I could start with you, what your sense of the advocacy has to be in addressing, you know, those concerns that for so long were on the, the dark corners of the internet. It's the responsibility of countries, it's not the responsibility of, of donors. Yes, definitely, uh, Ben. And for the very first time, will you hear sing, me sing praises of my country? Because especially our current, current government. So because of the civil society activism, South Africa has to take care of its own healthcare system, it's more than 75%. So the only money that South Africa is really dependent on from donors is the other 25%. And that is why we cannot, we cannot allow donors not to participate in the Global Fund. We can also not allow our countries to continuously to be corrupt and use the money for healthcare, you know, haphazardly and wrong. So it's important for activism. It's important for communities to understand their human rights. I always say this about activism and independent advocacy. It's that it's important for a country to have people who watch over what they are doing. So I like the fact that South Africa is doing something. I think other countries in Africa needs to follow suit and invest and invest in healthcare because we can no longer depend on donor funding. As we have seen with COVID, we were last on the burner and we still pained by it. It's not easy to forget how we had to so wait I, and how we had to lose family members because of COVID. I, I know, Yvette, that we're going to lose you because of the wonderful South African load shedding, which basically means you lose uh, electrical power in a little, a little while. So if we lose you, we lose you. You raise an interesting point. Countries like Kenya, like Eswatini um, and Rwanda have obviously really stepped up and uh, they've been at the forefront of promoting uh, replenishment this year. Um, and and I, I, I wonder, and it's really a question for Eddie and Kana, how you see the um, the advocacy of African civil society, but also uh, governmental leaders in really driving uh, towards the kind of replenishment needs that the Global Fund has to get for this next phase of the response. And Kana, do you want to kick off? I mean, you can see the commitment from countries. Uh, the Global Fund replenishment is co-hosted by 
you know, Democratic Republic of Congo, Kenya, Rwanda, Senegal, and South Africa. So there is a commitment uh, to ensure that the Global Fund continues to invest in services. But at the same time, there is an understanding that countries need to also look after their own health services. And I think part of this Global Fund, and if you looked at the preparatory meeting and further on, you can see a lot of commitments and a lot of discussions around domestic financing. Um, and I think on the investment case for the Global Fund, we're looking at catalyzing a scale of a domestic investment up to 59 billion. So um, a domestic investment across the globe of 59 billion. Yeah. Wow. That that is significant, and it's worth worth these uh, donors in the industrialized world knowing that. I mean, uh, Eddie, again, in responding to this sort of populism, uh, how do you feel about that? How do we counter it? Yvette has uh, mm, uh, highlighted the need for advocacy. Uh, for example, uh, as, if, as civil society, we are the voice uh, for the for the marginalized groups, especially those at community level. So in Eswatini, uh, our government committed to make sure that there are drugs, I mean, drugs are provided uh, in, in, in the hospitals. And those that need those drugs should make sure that they receive those uh, services or they have access to those services. Uh, as a voice uh, through the advocacy, we need to make sure that there is accountability and also to make sure that uh, as uh, resources are, are shrinking from uh, funders or from donors, uh, we should advocate more in terms of um, local funding, where we are saying there should be an envelope for domestic financing, uh, which is also address issues of sustainability. So that is where, how we are seeing it, uh, to move the advocacy drive, so that we make sure that our government are, are, are accountable to their commitment and they make sure that the, the, the funds that are available in country, they go to the most marginalized, they, or they go and support those marginalized groups. Thanks so much, Eddie. I think that's a really important message that, that we need to, need to take back. Now, I note that we have probably lost uh, Yvette courtesy of the uh, load shedding in South Africa. Um, and in a way, it's a shame because we get to what is the sort of elephant in the room, really. Um, we're recording this on um, the uh, 16th of September, uh, 2022. Uh, the replenishment conference in New York is due to take place um, at the beginning of next week. But also um, uh, the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II is taking place um, in London. And um, a number of world leaders that would be expected to be at the replenishment are going to be uh, on their way to the United Kingdom for that funeral. Um, and so that sort of unfortunately and totally understandably has created um, some disruption to the, to the process. But Kana, I wonder what this all means for the UK because we're still waiting to hear what the commitment is going to be. Um, I had an interview with um, the British diplomat Arthur Snell um, just last week, really about these very things. How do we appeal to the new trust government in the UK uh, to demonstrate the importance of this kind of multilateral uh, international solidarity and investment? What's your sense uh, if, you, if you're able to to discern it of what the UK may be doing and may be willing to do? The UK is a founding member and a long time partner of the Global Fund. Um, and I think in terms of civil society and the ministers and lots of discussions we've had in UK, I mean, UK does believe in the work the Global Fund does and they are committed to support the global response to protect hard won gains against HIV, TB, malaria. And to bring uh, and to build stronger systems for health. Um, so I think right now is more about we hope that UK will be at the pledging conference and they would have a number. Um, and I think right now is to wait and see. Um, but I, I think the Global Fund is part of. I mean, the UK is part of the partnership, 
And so I think, um, and also I just want to acknowledge the excellent advocacy from the UK Global Fund Civil Society Working Group and also the Global Fund Advocates Network and all the advocates globally who have been a vital voice in this replenishment and has really you know, worked with country partners, with their governments to really ensure that everyone steps up. Uh, Juno, you know, you're absolutely right. It's been one of the really impressive things to seeing the networks of civil society um, activists and organizations really step up and drive the advocacy. So uh, just one final question. Um, against the backdrop of the Global Fund Replenishment, we're also looking at um, a funding mechanism developed, I suppose, largely coming out of the recommendations of the International Panel on Pandemics Preparation and Response for a, a World Bank-led financing mechanism. And Kana, I know Frontline AIDS has been very much involved in um, uh, advocating for this, but also ensuring that, like the Global Fund, civil society is centrally involved in that. Um, is there any update that you can give us on where we are with this mechanism? Well, Frontline AIDS has been a key advocate and convener of civil society to engage and influence this, uh, the design and the process of this new financing uh, intermediary fund. Um, and in collaboration with partners and global civil society communities, we have called for civil society to have a seat, a voting seat on the board. And the, I can say right now, it was a win in regards to getting two voting seats on the board for civil society. Um, but we still have a long way to go in terms of engaging the financial intermediary fund around the role of communities in pandemic preparedness and getting investment to fund civil society and communities because it's still, um, and just to add that a lot of this engagement understanding why it's important to have civil society on the board comes from the global fund, from the learning of global mm -hmm. fund and also um, the Act A platform for civil society and community representatives. So we have learned from the lessons and from why uh, civil society and communities on board, on governance has really supported the response. And friend of the podcast, Elisha Dunn-Georgiou is I think one of those civil society representatives, isn't she, that's uh, on the uh, the financing mechanism. And of course, she was a guest on one of the first podcasts that we did uh, sharing the mic with, with Frontline Aid. So, so this is really good. But Kana, and I guess this is a question for you too, Eddie, why are we having an additional me funding mechanism when we have the Global Fund already, when we have Gavi that um, invests in childhood vaccines? What What's the rationale here? And are you concerned that there might be a cannibalization of resources? Eddie, do you want to kick off with that? Yeah, no, thanks, Ben. And is a, is a, I think it's a good question. Uh, I'm sure everyone in the postcard will understand that the the move now is to make sure that we ending AIDS by 2020. I mean, 2030. So, which means we need to make sure that what the gains, like I had highlighted earlier, that has been achieved, we make sure that we don't regress. So, all the efforts needs to uh, come together to make sure that we upscale our response which is one, and two, to make sure that the, the community systems uh, strengthening, especially the health, uh, have been built to be resilient and uh, making sure that uh, the, funding, uh, the funding that is coming together is making sure that is addressing uh, some of those structural uh, barriers that might have been missed in the in the implementation so for me as an advocate for more resources uh, i'm very much supporting the 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 i would say the the fast in terms of uh, making sure that there are a lot of uh, funding streams that are provided or that are there for countries to tap in and making sure that we move together towards the ending aids by 2030. 
Thank you. And, and, and I guess, Kanna, I mean, I see that we're at the top of the hour, but uh, uh, sort of to offer the final word to you, how optimistic are you that we will build the resources necessary to get, as Eddie says, to ending AIDS by 2030? Well, just to add around the fifth, I mean, one thing we are really advocating for is that any funding to this new financing um, uh, platform should be additional. It should not take away resources from existing global health needs, but also build on the foundation that we have, that the Global Fund has built on HIV, TB, malaria, and COVID-19 response. Uh, so it should not duplicate. Um, and so hopefully, if it all comes together, countries have stronger health systems and community systems that are delivering, you know, in an integrated way. So, you know, I mean, Global Fund is just one part of money. I, I think we need these multiple sources if we want to ensure that we have a sustained response in countries and meet the targets. Uh, so I think, uh, and Global Fund is an important part of it, and we need to meet uh, the 18 billion because the strategy right now puts communities at the center the first time we have this strategy that really is about taking, giving the money and to where it needs to go and invest in community systems and responses. Well, I think that is uh, an incredible and upbeat way to bring this podcast to a close. We'll be monitoring what happens over the next week or so. I, and indeed, I think uh, frankly, the replenishment for the Global Fund is a process that is going to have to continue. Uh, beyond September. Um, and let's hope that all the countries that haven't stepped up to the plate do so shortly and, and with that additional 30% so that we can get all the funds that the US have committed to. Well, with that, Kana, Eddie, thank you very much for giving us your time in this podcast to, to tell us about the Global Fund. You are both shots in the arm. Thank you yeah. for having us. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Ben, for having us and the, the team. I think for me, it was one of the experiences uh, sharing and also learning on also how other countries, countries are responding to the support uh, from Global Fund. And we are looking forward to the positive replenishment so that we can make sure that the effort that has been put on the ground, we don't regress, but making sure that we are making an impact. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Here's to the 18 billion. To the 18 billion. And thank you very much. And I hope people will follow on Twitter and other social media as we progress towards the pledging conference um, and see how we do. Thank you. Well, that's it for this episode. Thank you to our panel. And good luck to everyone from around the world involved in this last, final push to secure that $18 billion. Thanks to Finola Murphy, to Libby Vandenbosch, and of course, Ali Liu from Frontline Aids. Thanks also to our director and producer, Eric Aspera from Newsdoc Media. And finally, thanks to you. You can find us on our YouTube channel, LinkedIn and Twitter, and wherever you download your podcasts. Have a great week and a safe week, everyone.